Um, or you can vote yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. And you need to vote before and after for your vote to count, and we want every vote to count. So go vote. Thank you. It's enjoy, welcome, all lowercase, all one word. SohoVote.com. Thank you, Jane. Um, Hisako, I've just uh, called my wife uh, to come to the stage. You'll hear about her in a moment. Just want to add that we're partnered with Reason Magazine in presenting these debates. And you can uh, catch audio of all our events on the Reason podcast, which you'll find in the iTunes store. Thanks also to the Smith Family Foundation for making this series possible. For more information and to buy tickets to our future debates, go to our website at thesoloforum.org. I'm Gene Epstein, director of the Soho Forum. And as many, as, you, as many of you know, my wife, Hisako Kobayashi, prepares the delicious food you people have already been helping yourselves to. Hisako is also a world-class artist <laughs> who, has shown her work, who has shown her work on four continents. And starting this Thursday evening, she'll be having a solo art show a few blocks away from here at the George Burge Bears Gallery in Soho. Hisako, say a few words. Hi. My show is starting this Thursday, goes on until May 6th, and the uh, place is very close by, and this is in the heart of Soho, so you can enjoy the outing, and I hope you get a chance to see the show. Thank you. You can pick up printed invitations to her opening on the food table, and uh, she's also offering uh, her catalog. Uh, just give her a $20 bill, and you can have a catalog of her superb work. She's displayed for, for decades on four continents. On top of that, the George Bears Gallery has agreed to offer a 10% discount on all Kobayashi paintings to anyone who says the words, not Tom Woods in this case, but the Soho Forum. The prices started around $5,000, and to you Philistines who say, I can't afford to buy one, I say back, you can't afford not to, since they usually double in value every year. Now, with every Soho Forum, we have a warm-up act, and this evening, we are pleased to bring back the great comic, Dave Smith. Dave's podcast, Part of the Problem, has an enormous following, which certainly includes me, and not just because I've been honored to be a guest on Dave's show. The show's title, Part of the Problem, is derived from that famous line, you're not, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. Dave, please come on stage and tell us how to be part of the solution. Dave Smith. Oh, thank you very much, Jim. Oh, thank you. Thanks, guys. How about another round of applause for Gene Epstein, huh? Puts this whole thing together. Oh, I really do. I, I love these events. It's a glorious combination of my two passions, drinking and libertarian infighting. I don't know where I would be without either of those. I'd be lost, but here I am. Gene, you book me on the weirdest gigs I ever do. And I, well, the last one Gene booked me on was a, uh, a debate on sexual assault on college campuses. And I had to come tell jokes before that debate. And now, it's a debate on uh, fractional reserve banking. And I'll be honest, I missed the debate on rape. Like, that was an easier situation to make funny. Because I have no fractional reserve banking jokes up my sleeve for you guys. None whatsoever. I talked to a couple guys in the back who had a similar situation. So, my fiance told me this morning she was supposed to come. And then this morning, she started not feeling well. And then I was talking to her, I was like, do you think you're going to come tonight? How are you feeling? And she went, what's the debate on again? <laughs> and I said, fractional reserve banking. And she said, I'm just not feeling well. I don't think I'm going to make it out to that. And I was like, all right. But then why'd you want to know what the debate was on? That doesn't make any sense. The last one, she was like, rape on colleges? She's like, yeah, I went to college. I avoided rape. Let's do this. But this one, but it doesn't matter. This is an epic moment for libertarians, you know? We, f we finally get all of us together.
And what do we, obviously, we want to argue over an issue that only we care about. Like, that's what we do. You know, no one else even kind of cares about this, but I'm like, I can't wait to get this started. Like, I don't know. You know, come on, man. It's, it's the Mises Institute versus the Cato Institute. It's all that beef and everything, you know. Me, myself, I don't get into it. I stay above all of that stuff, you know. I mean, sure, did the Cato Institute rob that organization from Murray Rothbard? Sure, that's the history, if you want to know, for sure. Did they screw over the greatest libertarian of all time? Yeah, that's, those are the facts, but I'm not going to sit here and hold that against them just because they violated his property rights, the cardinal sin of libertarianism. I mean, whatever, that's not, that's not your fault. That's the history of the organization. I can get past that as soon as you issue a public apology <laughs> and pay all of the money owed to Murray Rothbard to the Mises Institute, plus interest, adjusted for inflation. Yeah, how's the fractional reserve banking working out for you guys now, huh? Not so good, am I right? Could have saved a pretty penny if we were on the gold standard. And by the way, to you nerds, I know there can still be fractional reserve banking on a gold standard. Okay, it's just for the sake of the joke. It's the only time a fractional reserve banking joke will ever work. So, it's the only. But whatever, I'm, I'm just teasing. I'm not going to sit here and insult the Cato Institute. I wouldn't do that. After all, Gary Johnson said that his number one intellectual influence was the Cato Institute. So, what insult could I possibly come up with? That would top what's already been lobbed at you people. His number one intellectual influence. Number two was his pot brownie. And that was, it was a close, razor thin, that they beat him. Although, <laughs> what do you think Gary Johnson's take on fractional reserve banking is? Any, any idea where he stands on the issue? I don't know. I'd love to ask. I'd love to really sit him down and grill him about what the pros and cons are about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. I said to someone in the back, I don't know why I take shots at Gary. It's like I'm, just, I'm kicking a dog, but I just feel like it's a dog that needs to be kicked. I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I've met him many times. He's a very nice guy. I have respect for him. Well, I don't know. This is a term lightly. I like him. He's a good guy, okay? I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I have no other fractional reserve banking jokes. <laughs> when it was the rape debate, I have like a whole line of Me Too the jokes. I was like, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Maybe I'll just tell the rape jokes again. I don't know. What do you guys think? All right, I'll tell you this. This is completely unrelated to everything, but it just happened to me on my way here, so I thought I would share it with you guys. So I, I live on the Upper West Side, and uh, so I was getting on the train to come down here, and I'm walking down the block, and there was like this uh, this tiny Mexican guy walking toward me. I don't actually know. He was, he was Hispanic. He was short. I'm guessing Mexican. And uh, he was loosen up. And um, so he's, he was walking toward me, and I'm walking down the block, and he was staring me down with just this angry Mexican, like, stare in his face. But he was tiny. And he was there with his girlfriend, who was tinier than him. They were like, they might have had superpowers. I don't know why they were so confident. But this guy's just staring me down. And it's like the whole block I'm walking, and he's still looking. And I'm doing this, th like, you know, like you kind of look away, and then you look back, and I'm like to check if he's still looking. And I'm like, still looking. He's still staring me down. And then I started getting angry, because I'm like, who the fuck does this tiny Mexican think he is? staring me down two blocks from where I live. And anyway, I was getting worked up in my head, and I was like getting prepared. Like I thought he was going to say something when I came up to him. And I was getting, like I'm not a tough guy, but he was tiny, so I'm getting confident. Like, I was, you know, I was like, I'm going to beat up this tiny Mexican on the way to the Soho Forum. And I'm just trying to think of fractional reserve banking jokes in my head. Like this isn't where I want to be. But I was like, I'm ready to go, and fine, this is going to happen. And we get closer, still staring me down, still looks angry. And now I'm like envisioning scenarios. Like I was like, I'm going to put him through that car windshield if he tries anything. You know, like just little boy fantasies in my head. And then we finally approached each other. He's still staring me down, and he just looks me right in the eyes. And he goes, hey, I saw you at a comedy club last week. You were really funny. <laughs> and... This is how unprepared I am to be known in the world. This never even entered my mind as a possibility. And nothing, I mean, it took me from my most furious 
to just loving this guy. I am one compliment away from just loving everything about you. The guy was like, I'm gonna kill this guy. And he was like, you're funny. And I was like, thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you. And he was like, you're funny. And I was like, thank you, I appreciate that. And then I got on the train and I spent a half hour on the way down here thinking about what an angry person I am and why I was, I was envisioning scenarios in my head. This guy it was the nicest person in the world. Just a friendly little Mexican. I don't think we should build the wall after all. I think they're good people. I think they're good people. They come here they're for work. I'm, now that I look back at it, Jeb Bush made some good points around that debate. Yeah. This, one was, this one's been a struggle for me. I don't know what to talk. I'm really glad that Mexican cut me off in the street because I didn't know what I was going to talk about up here. I do like the Cato Institute, by the way. That was just me just, you know, letting off some steam. I do, you know, I feel like every now and then they'll have a few articles that are just, I don't know. <laughs> like, really? Is that, I was reading stuff on there where they're like, uh, during the campaign, they were like, we just got to, what we need to do is just get Gary Johnson into the debates. Thank God Gary Johnson did not get into those debates. <laughs> do you have any idea what Donald Trump would have done to Gary Johnson in those debates? Donald Trump destroys human beings in those things. Somewhere Jeb Bush is still lying in a fetal position, crying over what happened to him. It's still... Hillary's fucking in India yapping about what happened. She wrote a whole book called What Happened. A whole book, What Happened. I could, I could write that book in one sentence for you. You lost to a fucking cartoon character. That's what happened. You were that bad that this maniac took you out. All right, well, listen, I'm going uh, to, I genuinely uh, am very excited for this debate. So thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you, Gene. Thanks, guys. Have a good time. Thank you very much, sir. Dave Smith, and uh, you, uh, you have to recognize that Dave is a switch hitter. If you have not listened to his stimulating podcast, uh, part of the problem, you were missing out. Give it a try. The guy is as, as brilliant a, an intellect as he is funny. So I do recommend, highly recommend part of the problem. Well, uh, now uh, we are ready uh, for the main event. Uh, and uh, we are about to close the voting. Arguing on the affirmative, for the affirmative, on the resolution, we have economist Robert Murphy. Bob, please come to the stage. <laughs> Opposing the resolution, we have economist George Salton. George, please come to the stage. Uh, it is, it is technically true that uh, George uh, joined the Cato Institute a few years ago, and uh, Bob has been with the Mises Institute, although he does other things with his life, too. So it is sort of Mises against Cato. Guys, uh, take a chair. Uh, uh, and uh, we have a resolution called Fractional Reserve Banking Poses a Threat to the Stability of Market Economies. Jane, please close the voting. Bob, uh, please uh, take uh, the podium and defend the resolution, Fractional Reserve Banking Poses a Threat to the Stability of Market Economies. Take it away, Bob. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. I, I realize as Dave was speaking here that I can now truthfully say that one time I uh, played a club in New York City and Dave Smith opened for me, so I'm happy to be able to say that. Also, I don't understand what the problem, just for what it's worth, I have plenty of small Mexican guys who love my work, and they come up, and it's never been uh, confusing for me. So, maybe Dave, Dave and I should talk more. You know? All right. The resolution tonight is a bit technical, and I've been encouraged, so I'm going to take some of my time in this opening statement to define some terms, but... Uh, I promise for those of you who are hip deep in this literature, uh, by the end of this, you know, I will give George a chance to respond, of course, and, we'll, we'll, and I'll, I will address like, his very subtle points, but here I can't assume people know even some of these basic terms, so let me define things from the start. The first distinction we need to keep in mind 
is the difference between like the base money, the whatever is serving as the actual money in the economy, so in our economy, of course, it's dollar bills, versus claims on the base money that commercial banks issue. Okay, and what's going to end up being significant, and this is the whole point of why fractional reserve banking is destabilizing or threatens financial stability, is that in most day-to-day -day transactions, those two things both can serve effectively as money that a merchant doesn't distinguish between someone, if something costs $10 and you try to give them this, they'll take it, or if you have a debit card and swipe it, and what that's, of course, saying is a commercial bank is telling the merchant, no, no, we, we have $10, this, this guy's good for it, go ahead and sell him the thing for $10 dollars or if you write a personal check historically commercial banks also issued pieces of paper that were claims like tickets issued by the bank that were called bank notes that was also effectively what it was was saying somebody who goes to the bank with this ticket is legally entitled to the underlying base money so again in our system it would be this back in the day it could be gold coins or silver coins now in that context, then, what do we mean by fractional reserve banking? It's easier first to say 100% reserve banking is saying if the commercial banks have issued claims, legally binding claims, saying the owners of these things we are promising on demand, we will give you the underlying base money, if they have those things 100% stored in reserve, so for all the claims in the community that the commercial banks have issued, if they have the base money 100% backing it up, then that, of course, is 100% reserve banking. In contrast, fractional reserve banking means that the banks have issued more claims to money, saying anybody who has this thing, we promise you show up on demand, we will give you money, and yet they don't have 100% of those in the vault. They've issued more claims than they could actually back up if everyone happened to show up at the same time. And this, of course, is what makes bank runs possible. So make sure you understand that under 100% reserve banking, bank runs don't happen, whereas it's fractional reserve banking by its very nature that says no matter how wise a bank's investments have been, that if the customers all show up at once and want to empty out their checking accounts, the bank's helpless. Again, it's not a matter of the bank you know, made bad investments. It's just that's the nature of fractional reserve banking. This is the famous scene you might remember the beginning of It's a Wonderful Life. right? Jimmy Stewart's behind the counter. There's a panic in the community. People show up and they want their money. And what does Jimmy Stewart have to tell them? He doesn't have it. Well, I'm sorry, Jim. I gave your money to Mary. No, I don't have it, right? <laughs> in case you're curious, yes, the whole point of that was to do my impression. So... <laughs> So that's, but again, that is there, it's because that's the nature of fractional reserve banking, okay? That's what makes bank runs possible, so keep that in mind. Now, another distinction we should make is between fiat money versus commodity money. So fiat money is, you know, tickets issued by, typically we're talking about coercive governments, it's not backed up by anything, and the money is only good to be money. In contrast, there's what's called commodity money, like gold or silver coins, for example, where the gold and silver are also regular commodities, but they also do double duty as, as uh, money in the economy. And so those things, that distinction between fiat and commodity is not the same thing as between 100% reserve and fractional reserve. And so there's four logical possibilities. I think it might clarify the debate tonight if I just walk through them really fast. So you could have commodity money, like gold or silver coins is the actual money in this community, and the banks also have to keep 100% reserves. So that kind of a system was the one that Murray Rothbard, for example, favored. We could also imagine having uh, our current system, for example, where there's fiat money and the banks are allowed to issue more claims on the fiat money than they have in the vault. So there's fractional reserve banking. That's our current system. A lot of economists you know, think that's fine, like Paul Krugman, for example, right? And then we have, you can imagine what I think about that. So, <laughs> And then we can also imagine that you could have commodity money, like gold or silver coins is the actual money, and yet the banks have to, and the banks though are allowed to issue more claims on gold and silver than they have in the vault to back up. So there's fractional reserve banking, but commodity money. So make sure you realize that's logically possible, and in fact, that's the system that like George Selgin and Larry White uh, talk about in their writings on this topic. And then finally, it's also logically possible that you could have a system that's got fiat money, like you know, dollar bills, but yet the commercial banks have to maintain 100% reserves, or in practice they do maintain 100% reserves on that. And actually, believe it or not, some economists are in favor of that. So Ed Prescott recently, I think it was in 2016, for example, had a paper 
So he's fine with having the dollar. He doesn't think the gold standard's a good idea, but he, he's fine with the dollar, but he thinks commercial banks should, keep, should issue 100% reserves or should be held to that standard. And why does he think that? It's significant for tonight's debate because he's saying that it's, it promotes stability. A lot of economists in the wake of the Great Recession, the financial crisis, were trying to say how can we promote stability. And one thing that Prescott and other serious award-winning mainstream economists have been looking at is maybe we should stop letting banks do this thing where they issue more claims on money than they can possibly fulfill in case there's a crisis. Okay, so uh, the last uh, sort of thing I want to just mention is... 100% reserve banking is possible, all right? And a lot of people, when, when this topic comes up, they scratch their, even economists, I've, I've gotten this reaction, they hear that somebody like Murray Rothbard is against fractional reserve banking, and so they say, well, how could that even work? I mean, how does a bank supposed to make money if it's not allowed to take your, you know, pay you a low interest rate for your checking account deposit and lend it out to someone else at a higher rate and earn the spread? If you don't let banks do that, well, then they would go out of business. Why would there be banks? Okay, so that's not correct, that, that, that objection. So what banks do, there's actually two distinct functions that banks serve. One is to be like a storehouse or a warehouse for your money just in terms of convenience and safety, right? So that it's, it's just more convenient for you instead of carrying around your cash on your person or in your vault at your house. The bank has nice big vaults. They have security guards. They have ATM machines all over the world. They've issued debit cards, and they have, you know, deals with uh, networks and so forth, with restaurants and things. It's just much more convenient for you, whatever the base money is, to be able to store at these things called banks and then to be able to spend it much more e uh, easily around the world. And, and it's safer, too. They, you don't have to worry about a burglar taking all of your money. And so that would be what 100% reserves would apply to, and that's fine. And the banks would, of course, not be able to pay you interest on your checking account. They would have to charge you somehow. Like maybe there'd be a slight fee every time you wrote a check or swiped your debit card. There might be a tiny little fee just for them. You know, they're giving you a valuable service. And in a market economy, if people want a service, they pay for it. And that's that. That's fine. The other distinct function that banks serve is to be a credit intermediary. Okay, so you've got people over here who want to save. Maybe you've got like 1,000 th people who want to save $200 each. And then you got people over here who want to borrow. Maybe somebody wants to buy a house and they need a $200,000 mortgage. In practice, it would be hard for them all to negotiate a bunch of different deals for that. And so the bank stands in between them. The savers deal with the bank. They lend their funds to the bank, and then the bank lends it out. And the bank has experts who can evaluate credit worthiness and so forth. The bank's much better at evaluating credit risks. And so that's, that's the service the bank is providing, and it earns the spread there. The crucial thing, though, is in that kind of a scenario that the savers are genuinely giving up access to their money for the period of the loan. So, for example, if you buy a CD, a certificate of deposit from a bank, maybe the deal says, okay, you, you buy it for $100 today, and then 12 months later they give you $103 back. So during that year, you're not walking around thinking you've got your $100 in the bank and you can go spend it at the grocery store if you want to. All right, you've, you've lent it to the bank. It's not yours until they pay you back with interest. So that kind of thing, that happens. That's perfectly consistent with someone who wants to have 100% reserve banking. It's just checking accounts that were called demand deposits would be conceptually distinct from, you could call them time deposits or savings accounts, but the loans would be different from putting your money on deposit just for you to have them store it for you. All right, so that's fine. So banking still works on 100% reserves. Now, let me talk about what, what's, the, what's the problem here. Okay, so now we've set the table here. So what is the problem? Why is fractional reserve banking inherently destabilizing? Let me just go do a historical thing because I think this is the, the best way to start out and think it through and to see the essence of it and why it's inherently dubious and it distorts market economies. And then, as I say, after George prepares, you know, we'll, we'll get into the, the uh, details of his worldview. So imagine historically the goldsmith, right? Back in the day, and this is loosely based, obviously I'm, I'm cutting corners here, but this is roughly consistent with what happened. Back in the day, the goldsmiths, you know, they're, they're making jewelry, they're making candlesticks, they had a lot of gold on them, they had to have vaults and so forth. So the people in the community realized, you know what, instead of us storing our gold in our houses, we'll give it to them and they'll keep it for us, it's safer. So they would do that, maybe pay them a little fee. And so the goldsmith has issued tickets to the people in the community. So let's just say... They've given him 1,000 ounces of gold that's in his vault, and there's 1,000 tickets now in the community saying, if I present this to Mr. Smith, the goldsmith, this gives me one ounce of gold. 
Now, it would, think about it. It would be very cumbersome in practice if somebody had to buy 200 ounces worth of goods for them to go to the smith, give them two, 200 tickets. He gives them bags of full of 200 ounces of gold. That person makes the purchase. Then the seller walks over, gives them the gold coins, and gets the 200 tickets back. The buyer and seller, if they both trust Smith, realize that's silly. I'll just give you these tickets. And then we don't have to walk back and forth and get the gold and put it back in. And so it's, it's efficient, right? It cuts down on the transaction time. And so once the community starts doing that, then Smith has an idea. He realizes the community, as they come to trust his tickets, they don't uh, feel the need to come in and redeem them very much. And so just as long as any time someone shows up with those tickets that he's issued, he pays them off, then the community trusts it, and they start treating those tickets as if they're as good as gold. They start functioning equivalently in terms of economically. And so then Smith realized, you know, I got 1,000 ounces of gold in the vault, and on any given day, at worst, maybe 30 of them get taken out. I got 970 sitting there, and then it gets replenished, and it bounces around, but it never goes below 920, let's say. And he realizes that's kind of wasteful. It's just sitting there doing nothing. Now, what he could do is just be reckless and go buy 500 gold ounces worth of stuff and splurge. But then he would permanently be low, and in case people wanted to redeem the tickets, he'd be, he'd be out of luck. So what he does that's more clever is he instead creates, let's say, 200 more tickets and lends them out to a very creditworthy business person who has a project that's going to cost 200 ounces of gold, and he charges, let's say, 20 per, or sorry, 10% interest. So that m person goes out, does the project. Now there's going to be more ticket claims than, than usual when he, once he does that. But still, maybe it'll go down to 700 that are sitting in his vault or what have you, 800. But he's still fine. He's not nowhere near being in a position of not being able to redeem a, a ticket if someone presents it. But notice the, the beauty of that technique. As long as that person pays off the loan the next year, what happens? The person pays 220 tickets back, right? The 200 loan plus 20. And so then Smith, what does he do? He, the 200 that he kind of created out of thin air, he just rips them up. And then the 20 left that were the interest on that loan, those now point to coins in his vault that are his free and clear. So he can take those 20 and do whatever he wants with it because now the community only has 980 tickets outstanding because 20 of them got paid to him as an interest payment. Now, there was nothing coercive about the, the interest and so forth, right? That, that merchant who borrowed the 200, he did something voluntary that the community valued. And so that's how that person got the 200 back plus the 20 extra. Now, what's the, the problem with this? So, of course, Smith likes that deal, right? He, he effectively, by just writing tickets out of thin air, lending them out, and then getting paid as long as he didn't make a stupid loan and got paid back, then he gets access to some of the coins that were in his vault that the community had put there just because they didn't want to be carrying them around. And so that what happened, he, you know, he had to first build up the trust, but once he had done that, he's now able to earn interest off of tickets that he floats over and above coins that he can back up at any time. So as long as he never gets caught with everybody panicking and turning all the tickets in, he can keep doing that. So why is this a problem? Well, it goes back to the Austrian theory of the business cycle. So here, my time is limited, so I'm going to have to hopefully assume most of you are vaguely familiar with the Austrian theory that Mises and Hayek developed. But that theory, just to be clear, does not blame bo the boom bust on like central banking. No, what that is the theory is based upon is the commercial bank's ability to create money and expand credit. And the crucial thing is, think about the goldsmith. He didn't create those 200 tickets and just distribute them randomly around the community. So they just pushed up prices here and there. What he specifically did, the way that 200 extra ounces entered the economy was through the loan market. He lent it into the economy, and then when he absorbed the 200 and destroyed it, it was pulling it back through the loan market from a loan being paid off. So the first price that got distorted by that new money and then the, pulling it out was the interest rate. The artificially low interest rate stimulates a boom, which inevitably leads to a bust, as Mises and Hayek say, and that's why fractional reserve banking is inherently destabilizing. George for the negative. George Selzin, please take the podium. Take it away. Thank you, Gene. Well, you know, after that uh, opening comedy act, I have a feeling that no matter how well I do at this debate, the Cato Institute is just not going to be promoting the, <laughs> the, the video. <laughs> I do want to complain uh, to start with. I have a complaint for Gene. Originally, I thought I would have to say nice things about bankers for 12 minutes. 
And that's pretty hard to do. And uh, now he tells me I have to come up with 15 minutes of nice things to say about bankers. And I hope you'll agree that makes my challenge much harder than Bob's of saying bad things for 15 minutes. But I'm going to do my best. Of course, what I specifically have to say, uh, the nice thing I have to say is that fractional reserve banking does not pose a threat to market economies. In fact, I'm going to argue that it's a very desirable market institution that's been made a scapegoat for other genuine threats. Now, there are actually two kinds of threats fractional reserve banking is supposed to pose, and, and Bob has alluded to both of them. It's accused of uh, causing systemic banking crises as a result of bank runs. It's also accused of fueling unsustainable booms not based on people's voluntary savings. I've got about 12 minutes, I think, 13, to counter both of those claims. So let's start with banking crises. This is the more popular concern of proponents of 100% reserves, meaning proponents who favor a fiat 100% reserve system, the Chicago plan of the 1930s, the sovereign money initiative of the Swiss in recent years. And the argument here goes as follows. Fractional reserve banks use deposits that can be cashed out by their uh, uh, claimants at any time. And they use them to finance loans with definite terms. And this mismatching of maturities, of liabilities and assets, makes the banks vulnerable, inherently vulnerable to runs, which are occasions, again, when everybody wants their money out at once, and the banks, of course, can't possibly come up with it if they're only holding fractional reserves. Now, I think even Bob would agree that, as far as this argument is concerned, isolated runs and bank failures are tolerable, and I would say they're actually sal uh, salutary. Uh, what badly managed banks lose, better ones gain. Because isolated runs, people take their money out of certain banks, put it in others. Some creditors may take losses, but you haven't got a systemic crisis. The problem is that bank runs are supposedly contagious. Panic spreads from bank to bank indiscriminately, and there can be widespread bank failures resulting in a monetary contraction and then a recession or even a depression. So what's wrong with this argument? What's wrong with it is it's more myth than reality. In fact, there's surprisingly little empirical foundation for this uh, scenario of banking crises. The proponents of the scenario almost always, and Bob give, gave you a good example, they mentioned the run in It's a Wonderful Life. Now, folks, that's a movie. <laughs> uh, and not only that, it's a bad example because the, 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 the Biddle uh, Savings and Loan, or Building and Loan, Bailey's, sorry, Bailey's uh, Building and Loan, actually that run is started when Uncle Bill loses 8000 bucks. So that bank is actually very badly managed. It probably deserves to fail, no matter how much Jimmy Stewart pleads for it. Because 8000 bucks was real money in 1945. Anyway, this run is not random. It's, it's depositors saying, we hear that you guys have blown it and we want to cash out. Uh, but a better example for the theory would be the bank run in Mary Poppins. I don't know why this isn't cited more often as evidence of, for the proponents, because there it's a pure rumor, right? The kid wants his tuppence and it's actually nothing wrong with the Fidelity Fiduciary Bank. It's perfectly sound. And yet there's a run that shuts it down. Well, here's the thing. Real-life bank runs are seldom unprovoked. They're almost always runs that are in trouble on banks that are in trouble beforehand, that have been badly managed, that their loans are not performing, etc. Take the runs of the 1930s, which are usually cited as kind of paradigmatic examples of unprovoked bank runs. The vast majority of those runs were in response to genuine bad news, often uh, concerning rural banks and agricultural areas. Agriculture prices were falling throughout the 1920s and early 30s. These banks were pre-run insolvent, is the technical term. They're not, being, they're not failing because they're being run upon. They're run upon because they're failing. And the runs had the desirable effect of shutting the banks down quickly before they become uh, can pile up losses and cause even greater uh, harm to their creditors. In the 1930s also, to pick that standard case, bank run contagions, panic spreading from bank to bank, were rare and quite limited. What appeared to be bank contagions started with the bank holiday declared by 
the governor of Nevada. Well, holidays are contagious. If you see a governor shutting down all the banks in his state, people in the next state are going to wonder whether that governor is going to do that too. And that was what started some uh, apparent contagion effects. Finally, in 1933, as most people here know, there was a big run in February 33, continued until the National Bank holiday declared by Roosevelt. That was a run on the dollar sparked by rumors that FDR would devalue. No monetary system that's on a gold standard can stand such rumors, but it wasn't the banks that were distrusted. It was the government's fidelity to the gold standard that was in question. Now, if we look outside of the U.S., we see even more evidence against the notion that fractional reserve banking is inherently vulnerable to crises. Take Canada up north, 1930s. How many banks failed in Canada? Zero. Canada was hit harder by the Depression than the U.S. was in most respects, but it had a sound banking system, and because of that, it had no bank failures. There's no evidence of inherent vulnerability. What's the difference between the US and Canada? Simple, we had lousy bank regulations. In those days, we have new lousy regulations now. In those days, we had unit banking. No bank could have branches, or very few. So they were under-diversified, tiny, undercapitalized Canadian banks branched nationwide, and were big and had lots of capital. They could withstand big shocks, and they were diversified. So the theory, if you would look at other countries, saying you get more evidence that there's plenty of sound banking systems out there, fractional reserve. There have never been any 100% reserve banking systems, by the way. That's something you should wonder about. Uh, there's never been a law against it, right? Uh, like some of the laws some people would like to have against fractional reserves. In any event, the theory doesn't fit. The inherent vulnerability doesn't fit. There is an alternative theory that the U.S. example points to. But if you look at world evidence as I have, you can see that it all fits. Banking crises are due to dumb banking regulations, bad government regulations. Now, I don't have time to elaborate, but I pose you this challenge. I used to do it to my students. You show me a banking crisis, I'll show you bad regulations, not just fractional reserves, takes more than that to cause a crisis. Uh, so what's happened here, what's happening here is fractional reserve banking is being made a scapegoat for wrong-headed banking regulations. It's being blamed for what's not an inherent problem to it, where regulations, bad government regulations, are the true cause. And I can show you by, for any evidence you name. Now, let's talk about business cycles. The charge here is that fractional reserve banks routinely engage in lending that's not financed by corresponding acts of saving, causing unsustainable malinvestment booms. That's the Austrian theory. Now, first of all, I want to say that I'm not opposed to this theory. I agree that lending, not backed by voluntary savings, contributes to business cycles. However, I deny that fractional reserve banks routinely engage in such lending. Now, uh, competitive banks, in fact, and we're talking about competitive commercial banks here, not central banks, those are an exception, are seldom a source of lending in excess of voluntary savings. I hope most of you will agree, if not all of you, that when people place funds with banks for definite terms, and I know Bob agrees because he just practically um, made this argument, say they buy a certificate of deposit or savings account where there's a term to the deposit, that those people are engaged in voluntary savings, making it okay for their banks and for the banking system to engage in the same amount of lending. Okay, so what about demand deposits? The difference here is not one in kind, but one of degree. Funds placed in a demand deposit account, and by the way, this was true in the days of the goldsmiths and even uh, in the earliest beginnings of banking. And I can go into the law on this if we have bring it up in question time. Funds placed in a demand deposit also still represent voluntary savings. Only these savings have no specific term. They are so many call loans or demand loans, a perfectly common thing in finance. We have loans that are made with no specific term. You can ask for the money back. An overdraft account is a call loan. Securities, markets, banks make call loans to them all the time. Now, uh, banks aren't earning enough lending on the basis of no voluntary savings. They're lending on the basis of voluntary savings where they have to estimate 
to what extent, for how long, the savings are at their disposal. Now, this, this poses an extra challenge, of course. Bankers have to guess how many savings are at their disposal and for how long. Having many depositors helps, of course, because although some are taking money out, the large numbers can usually result in offsetting deposits, so the actual pool of savings that are available, voluntary savings, is more constant than the actions of individual depositors might suggest. Still, of course it's true that bankers don't always guess right. There is risk. But that's why we have fractional reserve banks rather than zero reserve banks. The reserves are there to provide a margin of error. Reasonably safe reserve ratios are determined by bankers through the experience, just like capital ratios. They learn what cushion they can get away with. And over time, that cushion changes according to experience. In any event, when a competitive bank overestimates the voluntary savings at its disposal, that bank discovers the error very quickly through reserve losses. There's not much scope, therefore, for systematic overexpansion, lending beyond savings. Individual bank lends more than its customers are willing to provide. It runs out of reserves. So systematic overlending in a competitive system is very rare. So why do we have boom-bust cycles? Well, we have them mostly because of central banks. Central banks' IOUs, even under a gold standard, tend to be used as reserves by other banks. So those central banks aren't subject to the same discipline of competitive banks, where their uh, uh, notes and checks are being returned actively. So when a central bank expands instead, it's like a Pied Piper for the whole system. The other banks have more reserves, so they expand as well. But what has to drive this is a central bank. So here again, you have a case. By the way, I have a whole paper about it uh, called Bank Lending Manias in Theory and History, where I look at the most famous lending booms and show that in every case, it's not the reserve ratio falling. It's money being created by a central bank driving the whole system to expand with a fixed reserve ratio. Uh, and this is another case where fractional reserve banking has been made a scapegoat. The real culprit has been central bank misconduct. You want to solve the problem, don't throw out the fractional reserve baby. Get rid of the central bank bathwater. A quick side. While fractional reserve banks aren't to blame for malinvestment, they play a crucial role in avoiding underinvestment, which happens if le when lending falls short of voluntary savings. Ask me during the question period and I'll elaborate. Now, I want to add a couple points in the last minute or so on the positive role fractional reserve banks play that 100% reserve banks couldn't possibly play. And by the way, if you think those fees would be puny in the system that Bob was talking about, where you still use debit cards, etc., but you don't have, the bank isn't using your money, you can forget about it. You think your fees are lousy now, wait till you see how much that costs. That may have something to do with the fact that this alternative Bob brings up has never been popular historically, even though it's always been legal, even in the days before deposit insurance. Nobody wanted that deal. Banks could have offered it. What happened to the market? If it's so good, why didn't any banker ever think of offering this alternative system and advertising that the other banks were cheating? Anyway, banks and economic development. I don't want to come across as a fractional reserve Pollyanna. Even the best regulated fractional reserve system won't be trouble free. Some banks will fail. Some creditors will occasionally lose money. Banks will take part in booms. All of these things are, of course, less likely with 100% reserves. But fractional reserve banking has one huge benefit that more than compensates for its cost, which is the efficient employment of the public's scarce savings. I can't elaborate on this either in the time I have left, 30 seconds. I refer you to Book 2, ch Chapter 2 of The Wealth of Nations for an eloquent discussion by Adam Smith of how, at, how Scotland in the course of 100 years from 1700 to 1800 went from being a poor country to being almost as rich in per capita terms as England, all thanks or largely thanks, in, according to Smith and many others, to its efficient, free, fractional reserve banking system. Uh, so a parting analogy, if you don't mind, it's easy to fix one problem if you ignore others. But this is one of those cases where the fix is worse than the problem. Thank you very much. Uh, rebuttal from Bob Murphy. 
Okay, well, one of George's points is easy to respond to. He wondered why I didn't bring up Mary Poppins because my impression of her is terrible. So <laughs> that's obvious. All right, now he asked, now he mentioned some things and he said words the effect of paraphrase, like, look, for every crisis, that, and, and by the way, notice he started out by listing all the various economists who have proposed methods of limiting fractional reserve banking. So this, this isn't some crank idea that just Murray Rothbard and his followers are into. There are plenty of mainstream Chicago school guys and so forth who have dabbled with this because they, they're, they're noticing that there's this inherent instability and they're, of course, grappling with ways of trying to contain it. But he said for every you know, major problem they point to when apparently fractional reserve banking led to this huge disaster, he can find other government regulations that were also there that contributed to it. Well, I agree with that. The only way we'd know is if there were like in, you know, an ANCAP world somewhere, society, that the only thing is they allowed fraction reserve banking, and that would be the test case, and then we could see once and for all whether it works or not. But in the historical record, of course, we're never going to see that exact experimental case. And of course, I agree that you know, the laws were unit banking, FDR threatening to devalue and then following through with it. All those things, of course, those are destabilizing, and that will make it worse. So yes, looking back through history, the worst crises, like the benchmark we use to say, wow, that was really uh, an unstable economy for that period, wasn't it? The worst stuff that government all did put together is going to produce the worst results. So, of course, looking back at what we think of as really bad, messed up economies, we're going to say, yeah, there was more than just fractures or banking going on. But just think through what I said. I mean, that's obvious. Whatever the truth is of fractures reserve banking, what I just said is going to be the way history looks. Okay, and so what we're debating though tonight is to say, suppose we put those things aside, is fractional reserve banking inherently unstable? So let me just state before I re refer back to his uh, specific points, let me just make my argument here again. He agreed with the Austrian theory of the business cycle, the essence of it, right? And so those of you who are familiar with it, so again, I'm going to repeat my claim that George didn't challenge the last one, that the, the Austrian business cycle theory was not developed to explain how central banks caused the boom-bust cycle. It was explaining how the commercial banks expand credit through the loan market and that the, if you're familiar with the term Cantillon effects, that when new monetary inflation enters the economy, it doesn't just cause a general price rise. It hits specific sectors first and distorts relative prices. And so the Austrian business cycle theory is just a particular application of that saying if the way the new money enters the economy is not from a helicopter drop but through the commercial banking system, the first prices that it screws up are the interest rates. And it lower interest rates give a false signal to entrepreneurs to start long-term projects. That's why fractional reserve banking per se is inherently unstable. So yes, if that were the only thing and government didn't do anything else to screw up the economy, I agree that would be less unstable than what we see in the real world when government does all of it put together. But still, the essence of tonight, what we're saying is fractional reserve banking per se is inherently unstable. And so far, George, I think, has, has not challenged my claim that that's what Austrian business cycle theory is about. Uh, now, as far as uh, I think the main thing that his, he's, he is alluding to it, the remainder of my time here, let me just focus. It's a critical element in George's case here. And, and by the way, his argument is, 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 is very elegant. So if you haven't read the literature on this and, and seen his argument, it's, it's very clever and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea. I just think it happens to be wrong. Okay? And what, what I want to say is he's saying, oh, no, the, the one special case when fraction reserve banking doesn't cause the boom-bust cycle is if the community wants to hold more of these deposits under his free banking system the commercial banks only in, create more uh, money, if you will, and lend it out when the community wants to hold more. And so he's saying that is genuine savings, okay? And well, I want to just challenge it and say, no, it's not. So there's two ways. One is just the real quick glib way when he was saying, look, it's a, it's a spectrum. It's a matter of degree. You can have a one-year loan, a six-month loan. And basically when you put money in a checking account, you, that's like a, a very short-term loan that you just keep rolling over. No, that, that's not the same thing. Look, I could say... Oh, man, I, I, I had a bad job. I went to the gym yesterday. I was only there for 45 minutes. And then later, he said, you know what? Well, next week you see me, and you say, Psh, I was really bad last night. I went to the gym, and I didn't stay very long at all. And they say, how long did you stay? Oh, zero minutes. That's equivalent to saying I didn't go to the gym, okay? It's not that I went to the gym for a very short time. Once it's zero, that's it. When you give money into a checking account, and it's your money, he even said that, remember? He said, Those few, you think the fees would be puny if the bank's not allowed to use your money? That's the, look, that was the words he said, right? That when you have money in a checking account, you're walking around thinking you can spend that. You're not relinquishing control. That's the whole point 
of these what are called money substitutes, right? The commercial banks have issued claims on money that circulate in the community. They're as good as money. And so that's why it's inherently uh, destabilizing because it's not really, you're not lending money to the bank. Thank you. Look, George, George, your final rebuttal. Your rebuttal. Bob keeps mentioning all the uh, economists who favor 100% uh, uh, reserves, and there are a fair number. There are a lot more who don't favor 100% reserves. Let's not forget that, uh, the vast majority. And uh, I've looked at all of these, these arguments from the various schools, very many uh, countries, and they look at the U.S. badly. That is, they don't really study carefully what actually happened even here. Uh, we do have plenty of evidence. Look, there are no pristine, un unregulated banking systems, but we can see patterns in different countries at different times of where the crises happen, what kinds of regulations they have. And I've done a study of this, a couple of studies actually, and uh, it's overwhelmingly clear that the least regulated banking systems of the past, including ones without central banks particularly, uh, perform very well as far as the frequency of crises. The U.S. just happens to be a particularly bad case. It leads the race of those countries that have been studied in frequency of cri crises and in bad ba banking regulations going all the way back. Now, um, uh, Bob mentioned the Cantillon effects. Well, if you want to blame something for Cantillon effects, you should start with gold, since that's the case study that Cantillon actually originally emphasized. It was the discovery of gold and how it pours into the monetary system and affects relative prices and so on. I'm not making an argument against gold. I'm just saying that Cantillon himself didn't particularly single out fractional reserve banks. Uh, I would like to say something on this matter of degree versus uh, it's, uh, 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 difference in kind. A call loan is a call loan for as long as it lasts. Collectively, all of us leave money in our deposits, sometimes for a long time, not, sometimes for not very long. With the pooling of large numbers of such deposits and the constant inflow and outflow, bankers can reasonably assume they have a certain amount that's available to them for a fairly long time to, and can make loans and do this routinely. As for it being a, in any way uh, contrary to the rights or contractual agreements, there's no truth to that at all. Even in the days of the goldsmiths, and I can refer you to an article I've written called Those Dishonest Goldsmiths, published in the Financial History Review, all about the origins of fractional reserve banking. Could not, I could not find a tr any trace of evidence of there being anything dishonest. Look, there's an old legal rule that goes back to ancient times. It's older than goldsmith banking, which gets started in the 17th century. And it goes back to Judaic law. And for all I know, it's older than that. I've called it the bagging rule. It's a very simple principle. If you brought money to a money changer and later to a goldsmith, and it was in a sealed container, the understanding was that, that the coins in the sealed container were still your property and you were putting it there for storage. If you brought loose coins, the presumption was that you were making, they became the property of the banker. There were good reasons legally for this having to do with the lack of earmarking of coins. But the old, from ancient times was understood, the coins, the ownership went with possession, unlike with most goods. And this was a very, very old legal doctrine. And by the time of the goldsmiths, everyone understood. If you didn't put it in a bag and you didn't say otherwise, you're making a loan to the banker. You're not making a bailment, a, a deposit in the strict sense. The money belongs to the banker. What you own is a claim that gives you the right to have it back when you ask for it. And by the way, that's the only reasonable legal claim you could have because otherwise, strictly speaking, with a bailment, this banker would have to surrender the particular coins and that's where I, they would have to be in a sealed container. This was all long established law by the time the old first fractional reserve banks got started. Fraud had nothing to do with it, nothing. It's a complete myth that belongs in bad undergraduate textbooks. So, so, and we should stop repeating it because there's not an ounce of truth to it. Uh, that's really all I have to say about, about those points. We have the history, we have the reality of the law, 
And we have the theory that doesn't say that any fractional reserve bank lending is going to cause a business cycle. It says only that lending that's not based on savings, which a competitive bank can hardly get away with, is going to contribute to business cycles. That's why empirically central banks turn out to be the true culprits. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, two, two extremely worthy opponents, as I'm sure you both agree. Vigorous, vigorous people uh, debating each other this evening. Uh, you want to line up uh, at the mic over there to uh, uh, give us your questions. Uh, first, I want to ask uh, either side. Uh, George, do you want to put a question to Bob now? Bob, do you want to question, put a question to, uh, to George? Or do you want to wait for the audience? Uh, guys? Want to wave it? I, I would b maybe wait in case the audience doesn't ask the really zingers that okay, we have. Okay, George, you want, but George, you have a right, you, uh, pick up the mic. You want to uh, zing, uh, George? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off. You'll hold off, okay. Do this, mic, 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 make sure you have that mic. Uh, you, mic, right yeah, mic okay, yeah. Um, while you're lining up, I, I want to lob a couple of uh, questions at, at, uh, at both of you. Um, George, you, you uh, conceded that as far as the argument goes, in a way, uh, uh, 100%. Uh, backing is a little bit more stable, but then you had about only a very short time to say, ah, but there's something else. And, and uh, as far as I gathered, you seem to say, well, it's cheaper or it's more efficient. But could you elaborate on what you mean about what is the advantage of fractional that minimizes instability? Could you? Yeah. Right. So yeah. fraction, is it on? Fractional yeah. reserve yeah. banking does have cost. It does mean, and Adam Smith recognized this too, it does mean that banks will be more vulnerable to failure, right? And people will occasionally, even creditors will lose money if the, if the capital isn't there, although when we didn't have deposit insurance, we had 25% capital ratios for banks as protection against that. But bad things will happen. But it, it's the, the counterpart, the reason why it's worth it, as Smith argued and many others since, is that you're taking a large sum of savings that are actually there that are little driblets here, there, and everywhere, and you're accumulating them and investing them productively. That's what the Scottish banks did. That's what fractional reserve banks generally do, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. And that adds up to a lot more economic growth and development, and that, of course, is very important. Rondo Cameron, an economic historian, late economic historian from the University of uh, from, uh, Emory, wrote two books all about this, Banking and, er, the, er, and Industrialization and Banking and Economic Development. He and his co-authors surveyed all the history of all the industrialized nations in one book and then the history of many unindustrialized ones in the other, asking what banking did or didn't do. And the answer that came out of this was the freest banking systems contributed to industrialization in countries that suppressed their banks, which meant in practice fractional reserve banks, uh, did not industrialize Banking played a crucial role. All of the, the wealth we're used to today, banking, fractional reserve banking, because there has never been any other kind, with rare exceptions, uh, all state-sponsored, by the way, uh, uh, is what made it possible for the industrialized countries to get that way. That's no small thing. Uh, do you want to comment on George's answer? Well, well, sure. If you just parse what he just said, he said, okay, the, you know, the historian, they look and see that those country, the governments that didn't mess with the banks and just let them do what they wanted to, they, they grew, whereas the ones that regulated weren't. And then he added, and by the way, there's never been 100% reserve banking. So that proves that these governments that were intervening in their banking sector, it wasn't to enforce 100% reserves. So, yeah, I have no problem with the argument or the claim historically. If you look at states that interfere with their banks, they tend to grow less than states that, you know, I, I'm not for regulating. By the way, I am not for the government... Even if somebody releases chemical gas, I don't want the government punishing that. I'm certainly not going to say punish them for issuing fractional reserve banking. So this is not an argument about political crackdowns on banks. We're talking about the economics, so that's what I'm doing tonight. Um, uh, my question to you, Bob, is uh, in terms of this idea about the demand deposits and savings, uh, if, uh, if there is complete transparency, uh, which I think you've stupid, if indeed uh, everybody says, uh, all banks say, uh, you're depositing this money, and we, and we have a, uh, a great presentation from Bob Murphy from the Soul Forum on exactly what this means, that there's going to be a fraction reserve banking. This is what it means. This, these are the risks. You've, uh, you signed a document. You understand the risk. What do you choose? And then let's say everybody chooses fraction reserve banking because it's cheaper, uh, the cheaper alternative. So 
would, would you say that that's sort of like an affirmative action to say, well, okay, I'm saving. I'll leave. It's like a call loan. Would you, would, would you concede that argument or what would be your pushback about that? Okay, so let me clarify. Uh, George said up there, he said in his last remarks, let's stop repeating the claim that this is fraud. I didn't say it was fraud. Okay, so I, yes, other people who have my side on this, they do make that argument. I'm not saying it, it's fraud. All right, what I'm saying is economically. So, yes, I'm saying economically, when you have money in a checking account, you don't view that as that you're lending money to the bank. You still think you can spend that money. It's serving the same function to you as if you kept cash in your purse or your wallet. And that's why the, the merchants in the community, I mean, that's why we're not that are considered perfectly legitimate and, and no, no doubt, then the community treats them as equivalent to money. So that's the problem. But, 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 what, but, but what if everybody listens to the solar form debate? Selgin concedes there are risks involved. You tell people, look, this money may not be there, you know, whatever you want to say. So they say, well, I want to do it anyway. So there's no there's complete transparency. Wouldn't, would you say that, that then they're saving the money in, in a sense? When they to say, well, I understand the risk. I would rather just have the fraction rather than 100% because the fraction is cheaper. Would, would, you cons would you agree that that's, that would be savings if there's complete transparency and that and the money is not, may not be there? No? Okay, so the, the, the problem is so, – so no, I, do, I don't think so because there's two – there's now two sets of people walking around having access to the same yeah. savings. And so that, that economically, that, that can't you're, – you're having the benefits of command over present goods. You, know, you could spend it if you wanted to, and yet you've, you've effectively lent the money out. So, so no, I, I don't think it's the same thing. I understand. Uh, first question. Please phrase your, try to phrase your question as a question uh, and tell us who you might be addressing it to, if anybody. Thank, sure. take it away. Thank you both for coming out tonight and debating. Um, actually, you guys answered my question in the last uh, minute or so, so just a more lighthearted question for Dr. Murphy. Um, in your book, Choice, you mention uh, different groups or different people minting gold coins, and one of them was actually the Selgin Mint. Is that referring to your debating uh, no, opponent tonight? That's some other Selgin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, no, I do think that Selgin is mint. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I, that, that was an homage. I saw him give a talk at the Mises Institute on the, the history of private coinage. So yes, the, 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 mark, the market can produce money, it can produce banking services that you don't need the government to be involved in money and banking at all. So yes, that was an homage to the talk I saw him give about how beautiful the coins were that private uh, mints produced. Okay, let's not Thank make you. nice guys. Uh, let's, uh, let's have a next question, please. This question's for both. <clears throat> Is there a qualitative difference between fractional reserve banking and say someone like myself counterfeiting money and then lending it. Um, who wants to take that? I'll start. Yes, there is. <laughs> because there's no, there's no illegal activity involved in fractional reserve banking. The bank is, make, is taking in credit in the form of uh, call loans that are made to it. It's an intermediary, as we say. And uh, it is turning around, and on behalf of the people lending to it, it is making loans to others. And as soon as the lending to it ceases, that is uh, the end of the availability of credit to the bank and has to curtail its own loans accordingly. And this is exactly what goes on in competitive banking systems. They lend as much as they can lend because the money is at their disposal, though no one has made a specific uh, agreement as regarding how long, and they have to estimate that, but they're not lending anything that doesn't, uh, that's illegitimate. They're not creating claims that are different in kind from the kinds of claims they create when they deal with term deposits. The only difference is they have to speculate less with term deposits. It's not as tricky but large numbers of independent depositors make it not so difficult to be a fractional reserve banker and be prudent about it. Uh, uh, once you introduce deposit insurance, indeed, then you start having a lot less prudence because the depositors themselves are less picky about where they put their money. That's when things really go south. Do you want to comment, Bob? Well, well, notice. I mean, he, George went right to the the legality of it, and so that I think that is a hint here that there is that your question was clo the nature of what's happening there. So I, yes, I, I would say if if you understood why just you being able to print up hundred dollar bills 
Um, but but it's not it's not just the fact that that's inflationary. It's if you lent them out. That that's really the issue. So be, to be clear. I am not talking about the fraudulent nature, even though there are people who make those claims with the bailment contracts. There is that literature. That's not what I'm here saying. I'm saying that if the money enters through the loan market, those prices get pushed down first, and those are not the correct prices, that the community has not saved more just because the banks decide to issue more tickets. Uh, next question. Hi there. Uh, this question is more for Bob, but I would love if both of you guys wanted to weigh on this. Um, it seems to me that the crux of this issue, it really boils down to the inflationary, does inflationary pressure, inflationary activity lead to a boom and then a bust? And that can be through a central bank, that can be through fractional reserve. And it seems like there's a bit of a debate on that point whether fractional reserve does in fact inflate or not. In my opinion, it, it seems clear, it, it does. And so my question really is, what is it about the inflationary behavior that leads to malinvestment, the boom, and, well, the boom I understand, but then the eventual bust why, why does that inflation, be, be it fractional reserve or, or in central bank, whatever, lead to malinvestment and then, and then a bust? Um, you want to, okay, Bob, check it, but I want you to respond to George. Uh, okay, so, so yes, I, and I believe it, you know, George's framer, he calls it inside money, so I, I don't think he's going to deny that there's a sense in which banks create money, but he's going to say under his scenario, it, it's not destabilizing. So f from my perspective, again, if... The problem is you, you need to know what do interest rates do. They, if the community genuinely saves and refrains from consumption, that frees up resources. Then if it goes through the loan market, lower interest rates tell entrepreneurs, oh, there's more real savings to invest in longer-term projects. So if the community hasn't refrained from consumption and the reason more loans are available is because now the banks are issuing more claims, then that price is wrong. That's why if it enters through the – so it's not inflation per se – that we're talking about tonight, it's that if inflation comes through the loan market and just the nature of fractional reserve banking, when banks create money in a certain sense, that's how the new money enters the economy is through a loan. George, you want to comment? Yeah, I just want to elaborate. I don't disagree with what, uh, uh, what Bob said uh, uh, on, on the question of fractional reserves and inflation. It's just not true that fractional reserve banking involves a higher inflation rate uh, generally. If you have a, a, a system with a 10% reserve, just to speak of that case, and another with a 100% reserve, and let's say uh, gold is flowing into each system at the rate of 5% uh, per year, and there's no changes in overall in people's demand for money, let's suppose it's constant, the price, the, the inflation rate will be, f and, and output is constant, the inflation rate will be 5% in the 100% reserve system, and it'll be 5% in the 10% reserve system. The reserve ratio doesn't tell you what, uh, about the rate of growth of the money supply being any different once you've settled into that reserve ratio. It's uh, different if you're growing a reserve, fractional a reserve system out of nothing, then you have a one-time increase in the price level. Uh, we uh, have a, a question that uh, came in uh, from, the, uh, from the virtual space. Uh, inevitably, uh, we can't talk about money and banking without quote, talking about Bitcoin. And so one of the questions, the question that came in is could Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency be some kind of base money as gold once was? Uh, could Bitcoin become some kind of base money as gold once was? Uh, somewhat relevant to the debate. Could uh, both of you respond to it? You want to go first? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, Bitcoin, if it were money, would be base money. It, it's, it's not a claim or an IOU, which is what inside money, to use the expression Bob used, is. So it, the Bitcoin can't be anything but a base money if it's money at all. Whether it's money at all depends on how widely used it is as a medium of exchange. So uh, then the question that grows out of that is can you have a fractional reserve banking system develop on top of a Bitcoin standard? And the answer is in principle you can. Whether the regulators would ever allow such a thing, of course, I, I doubt it very much. Any comment, Bob? Sure. So, yeah, like George said, I mean, in the Austrian monetary framework, Bitcoin's clearly a medium of exchange, but it's, 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 not, it's not universally accepted. So I would say technically it's not money right now, but in principle, if everybody embraced it and used it, then it could be a money at that point. Um, the, the narrow point just for the, the two purists in the room who are familiar with this literature, let me very quickly say about that is all of the things that George talks about, the benefits of having like um, a, a flexible or expansionary c currency that you have with fractional reserve banking in principle 
if you had a, a cryptocurrency that was tied to like maintaining a certain you know price level of, of a basket of commodities or whatever, you could theoretically imagine that sort of framework, and that new money would not need to enter the economy through the loan sector. So I think all the problems with you know sticky prices and the, the alleged benefits of FRB, just as a counterexample, just imagine a world where the cryptocurrency comes in and just you know, regulates the price level. So if there's a deflationary shock or inflationary, the quantity of base money expands or contracts, and that doesn't have the, the alleged problems of gold. So I'm just saying conceptually, that that's not I'm favoring it, but think through the logic of that if you're really hip deep in this literature to see his claims about FRB actually don't work or you don't need them because you can imagine that logical FRB, alternative. FRB, you mean the Federal Reserve Board? Fra Fractional Reserve Bank, no, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can I respond to that, Gene? Oh, yes, go ahead, yes, yeah. Yeah, there are actually two separate issues here. One is whether the money supply as a whole adjusts in a way that avoids problems of uh, uh, severe deflation, that sort of thing. And, uh, and that is ultimately, that's ultimately a challenge of getting your base money right. You know, you either have to rely on a very competent and uh, 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 perhaps omniscient central banker, or you better pick the right commodity or come up with a clever uh, cryptocurrency that that's smart in macroeconomic terms. That's different from the Adam Smith point, which is about being uh, not squandering resources on your money supply unnecessarily. So gold is very expensive. And as many of you know, cryptocurrency is also very expensive stuff. It's, it's a high cost of production, and the coins are worth exactly the energy that goes into them in, the, in equilibrium. So it's expensive. Uh, what Smith is talking about is the social savings. I know that sounds communist, but that means the savings to society. All right, don't get all you know hot and bothered about it. <laughs> There's no ist there. Um, the, the, it's the savings to society of making a little gold go a lot further and having a money supply that's 10% gold and 90% and, and uh, uh, credit uh, versus 100% gold. It's very expensive to have a 100% money supply. And this is not inconsistent. What Smith is favoring is totally consistent with uh, having a, uh, the, the uh, lending that's going on behind a fractional reserve system be a perfect mirror image of people's willingness to hold IOUs instead of base money. So you hold IOUs, your willingness to do that, for any length of time, supply savings to the banks, they can lend, and in turn you get a money supply that's a lot cheaper in real resource costs, and society can uh, use those ex uh, savings to invest more and produce more. That, so that's okay. separate from the behavior of the price level and all that. No comment? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so just to make sure you got what he was saying, Smith's argument was that it would be wasteful to have to, like, dig up all these gold coins. What if instead we could have just 10% of the gold coins and then 90% of the money being claims on gold, then that 90% of the gold's not sitting uselessly in vaults. It's freed up. Um, I'll return to that point in my, in my closing remarks, but let me just mention that, you know, that, that is a distinct point, so that's one possible downside of fraction reserve banking in terms of, or sorry, of 100% reserve banking is that perhaps there's this fixed overhead. Um, and, but I would say at worst, that's, that's analogous to saying, well, you know, it's really expensive that people have to put locks on doors. And if we could just free up those resources, but given the way the reality is that putting those locks, that's, that's optimal right now. And we can imagine a different world. So I would say, you know, that's, that's what I'll say here. I'll come back to that point um, in, in the closing as well. Next question. Thanks so much for the debate. Um, given that, I know this is more of a macroeconomic expediency debate rather than a fraud legal debate, but given that the most natural and intuitive understanding of a bank note is under 100% fractional reserve banking, what is the contractual nature of a bank note under fractional reserve banking? And also, if you have a system with fractional and 100 reserve banking uh, in a free market simultaneously, aren't those contracts different in nature? And also the same question about different uh, percentages of fractions in fractional reserve. Uh, you want to take a Georgia? Yeah. A banknote is and always has been an IOU. It's a debt instrument. I have a little article. I have a blog, uh, sort of a blog. It's our essay on, uh, on called Altam. It's f from, uh, it's, it's Cato, so make what you will of that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's, it's called... Uh, uh, banknotes never uh, aren't and never have been bailment instruments. And it shows a bunch of old banknotes, 
commercial banknotes. And then it shows a bunch of bailment certificates. And you can see the language is completely different, completely different. A bailment certificate always says, we have on deposits this stuff for you. A banknote says, we will pay this note on demand for X dollars. So that's what they are. That's what banknotes are about. They've never been tickets. They've never been property certificates, as the, 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 some of the literature from the Austrians says. All of that is just not true of what banknotes ever have been. Uh, so that's their legal foundation. They're an IOU. They're more like a little bearer bond, a circulating bearer bond with a call option, a put option, pardon me. And, and, uh, and that's the legal foundation. The money that you surrendered when you took the banknote or a deposit credit balance uh, became instantly the banker's property to do whatever the banker wanted. But the banker had an obligation to come up with a certain amount of money when you came to ask for it, which could be that very day. And if the banker didn't meet that obligation, the banker was in default with severe repercussions. Uh, so that's the legal foundation. Comment, Bob? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. So again, I want to be clear. I don't want people to confuse this, is that I am not here arguing from legality or saying there's fraud going on. I'm speaking economically. Let me just try this analogy. Maybe this will help. Imagine economists watching someone at a restaurant. The guy goes into the restaurant. He takes his coat off. He hands it over the counter. He gets a piece of paper. He goes and eats his meal for an hour, comes back, gives the piece of paper, and gets his coat back. If we as economists said, huh, he lent his coat to the restaurant for one hour, and then he gave him $2, so there must have been a negative interest rate. This is interesting, right? We would be misunderstanding what happened. He wasn't lending the restaurant his coat. He was just saying it would be inconvenient for me to carry my coat around and have it with me while I eat, so I'll let them hang on to it. I still have all the advantages of having instant access to my coat if I want it. Likewise, when you make a deposit into your checking account, and the fa it's crucial to the argument that those balances, the claims on the bank, circulate in the community effectively as money. And so that's how you're actually not giving up anything. You're not suffering the, you know, in other words, why are you putting it in a checking account rather than buying a 12-month CD? Because you're thinking, I might want to spend this tomorrow. And so it's serving economically the same function as money in your wallet so long as they don't default on it or, you know, say you can't redeem it. And so that's why it's, th there's this problem. Again, that's the whole reason Mises developed this distinction. He had money substitutes and then what he called fiduciary uh, media and money certificates. That's why he developed that, because he said there's something peculiar here when the community begins accepting these claims to be basically as good as money, that that's, that opens up Pandora's box. Yeah, one quick comment. Um, yeah, Mises didn't, didn't have room in his classification for, for, for callable loans, obviously, because that's, that's, what, that's what the debate here is about, is the legitimacy of uh, deposits that are, that are that, that are basically just callable loans you, you, no, 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 without a term. Anyway, that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say something more about banknotes because it's germane to the question of 100% versus fractional banking. Uh, at, until relatively recent times, banknotes, circulating IOUs, were the more common form of bank liability, whereas deposits that were checkable they were used by well-to-do people for fairly large transactions, but the, the common people were more likely to deal with a bank by holding its uh, paper IOUs. You cannot have circulating paper IOUs, at least not with any technology that has been, had been extant in the past, f with 100% reserve backing. And that's because the ownership, in order, if the ownership is changing all the time, uh, uh, that is the person holding the note who owns the gold, because now we're talking about a certificate, not an IOU. That person is changing anonymously. The bank can't send a bill to the person whose gold is being stored and therefore cannot charge for the service unless some sucker wants to pay perpetually for gold that he's passed their certificate on to somewhere else. So the whole idea of circulating banknotes in a 100% reserve system is a non-starter. It never would have worked. You could only have deposits where people could transfer the deposit balances, but there could be no circulating notes. Uh, next question. Uh, my question is for George. Um, if we were to have industry standardization rather than a, uh, let's say, a legality form of banking, would that not create more of 
a natural cycle to put the proper amount of capital in the system. So like if you have 100% reserve of what I deposit in the bank, then all my transactions are at like 6%. Whereas if I have 20% that the bank's allowed to loan out, and then I'm allowed to do all of my transactions through the bank at 0%, would that not create more of a natural sliding scale? Um, I mean, I go to the store and I buy uh, shower curtains and there's 12, and I buy a curtain and there's 12 holes, and I buy a, uh, a rod and they all fit together. Would that not naturally happen in a, uh, a situation like that and create the well, proper amount of credit? Could you explain the question as you understand it, George? And then answer. Well, I'm not sure explain I fully understand it. I think. Explain what you want to uh, respond to. Well, uh, what part do you want to I think to? the question is why don't the banks just say, look, uh, we have 10% reserve accounts, 50% reserve accounts, and so on, and you pick it and it's all specified like that, right? And, and the, the answer is that the reason bank reserve ratios have to be able to fluctuate for fractional reserve banking to work well because there are unpredictable changes. The bank, bank cannot. Uh, conveniently predict and state a fixed reserve ratio without putting itself in a position where it can't use the reserves when it needs to. We have to. We shouldn't be speculating about what the mar and, and this is the bigger answer to your question. Why are we speculating about what bankers might do, might offer to their customers when we've had now three, four centuries of banks in many places offering different products? They've discovered, they discovered fractional reserves, they discovered how to administer them, and for the most part, though we know all the horror stories, uh, and in some places, much more obviously, this system uh, worked very well for many, many, many people. Bad banking systems have always existed. I'm afraid there are more of them now than ever, but we can trace that to the pernicious interventions of government adulterating what was otherwise, otherwise be a, a very satisfactory market product. To pick up on that question, George, have you said, I think you've gone on record as saying that Scotland actually practiced something like 5% backing? Is that low? In, 18, in the 1820s already, Scottish banks generally kept specie reserves of more like 1%, 1 to 2%, with secondary reserves in the form of uh, exchequer bills that could be easily cashed in London. And this was a result of, of experience. And they had uh, almost a century of a very, very stable and productive banking. And a Scotsman who got hold of a gold guinea couldn't wait to trade it for a good Scottish banknote. They wanted nothing to do with those clunky old coins. Do, do, you, do, you, project, do you think that that, what, that would happen? We'd have like 1% with some? Well, I don't know what would happen now. Uh, uh, but uh, but the past speaks uh, uh, very clearly on the potential for fractional reserve banks when they're properly regulated and, and uh, structured to get by with very low reserves and yet uh, be incredibly safe and solid. Uh, Canada is another very good example of that. Uh, 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 again, uh, about a from 1870 to depending on when you want to cut it off, 1935 or World War One. A uh, very, very stable banking system with with more go role for government than Scotland, but still relatively little government intervention. Comment, Bob, or you want to? Can, can I just ask for a point? I've heard claims that the Scottish banks suspended specie redemption for like 23 years or something. Do you agree with that? Or yes, they did. Um, what happened was uh, something called the Napoleonic Wars. Wars do have a way of of uh, disrupting things including all kinds of things that normally would uh, work differently. And what happened was in 1797, uh, England went off the gold standard. And, uh, of course, Scotland was basically a very small economy, very heavily involved in trade with England. And it just didn't make any sense for the Scottish banks to, uh, to retain the gold standard while the rest of the British Isles uh, uh, went off. So they uh, suspended in sympathy and probably more or less illegally for the only time. But their customers did not mind and were rather relieved. Actually, believe it or not, all accounts suggest that the English people were very glad when the, the, the English banks suspended because they were very fearful of what was going to happen to the banking system otherwise. So yes, this is uh, you know an example, though, of... Uh, uh, a, a force majeure, which is something that can upset insurance contracts, all kinds of normal market arrangements get 
made topsy-turvy, we shouldn't expect uh, any market institution to be able to hold out under all circumstances. No comment? Yeah, okay. Uh, next question. Hi, uh, my question is for Dr. Murphy. Um, there seems to be a tendency for both of the debaters to agree that there is a tendency towards fractional reserve banking in a free society. So my question is, in a stateless society, how would you enforce 100% reserves? This is going to have to be the last question because we're running out of time. Uh, Bob, take it. Okay, let me um, – my position that I'm taking for this debate uh, is actually the one that Mises takes in Human Act, and I think this will clarify – so I'm, I'm okay with being for free banking. I don't want political interference with the banks. I just think under genuine open competition in markets, property rights and so forth that, you know, the private courts would enforce, banks would be lent, you know, the same sort of mechanism and considerations that George and Larry White talk about in some of their work, I think would just hold them much closer, 100% reserve, much higher than the 1% to 3% that he said he was okay with. Okay, uh, guys, uh, I'm going to have to uh, close this, and uh, George... You get uh, your uh, five minutes of summary, followed by uh, Bob. So uh, you, you can take the podium. I feel bad. All right. Up to, it's up to you. Up to you. I'll take it. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we have skirted around the legal uh, question, and I think that that's fine. I, I, I appreciate, actually, the fact that Bob has not been pressing the legal argument. And my only reason for bringing up the goldsmiths was because he did sort of repeat that history that you often hear where they first were taking stuff and storing it and then they started issuing more tickets and so on. I merely wish to say that's not what actually happened in England at that time. But to close up, to wrap up, uh, I think we have to be more conscious of, of uh, the, the distorted view we have of banking, which has become uh, 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 more or less a an account of all the disasters that have happened in banking, uh, both in our own li lifetimes and uh, disasters we've heard about in the past. This is uh, looking at the industry through a distorted lens. What people don't realize sometimes, because it doesn't make the newspapers, is the long history of successful, stable, fractional reserve banking systems. And unfortunately, because governments have become more and more aggressive in their interventions and regulations, we are less and less familiar with the potential for stable fractional reserve banking all the time. And it's very sad to find my, myself debating what feels like a dying institution for which I have very uh, positive feelings generally. But uh, the real bottom line here that I'd like to stress is this is an activity that consenting adults have agreed to engage in for hundreds of years that, has, and that we know can produce desirable results that does not necessarily result in business cycles and indeed uh, doesn't contribute at all to business cycles as long as we allow bankers to compete with one another aggressively and check each other's expansion as they will do in a competitive system. We should not blame fractional reserve banking for problems in the past or in the future that are properly attributable not to that institution itself but to the interventions of governments especially through central banking and through other unwise banking regulations and I feel that all the advocates of 100 percent reserve banking have simply got it wrong they have taken an institution that is itself not uh, unsound and that does a lot of good and they have attributed it, uh, they have blamed it for problems that it is not really to blame for. It's rather as if we decided that there were too many traffic accidents on certain roads and decided to ban automobiles without recognizing that the problem was the design of those roads or perhaps faulty automobiles. We have to decide whether the institution itself is fundamentally unsound, and I think that the answer is it is not unsound. The historical facts will simply not bear up the support, the argument that there's an inherent problem of instability in fractional reserve banks. Thanks. George is very confident when he makes assertions about the historical record. Let me just point out two 
things that were incredible uh, admissions that came from it just to say that you shouldn't just, the fact that he's very suave and confident does not mean that his statements about history are accurate. It just is a general rule, especially if you're in a, a club in New York City and someone says something to you and he's suave and confident, be very afraid. Okay. He, he said there, he said, oh, for the, of course these are callable loans. Of course these are, this is the standard. This goes back hundreds of years. And then he said, it was an offhand remark to me, well, of course Mises didn't call it that because he didn't have the terminology available to him. Okay, so I'm not saying there was a necessarily a contradiction there, but you see that the way he's now describing it and saying this is what everyone knew for hundreds of years, apparently as of 1949, Mises didn't have the, that terminology available to him because that practice hadn't developed fully. So I'm just saying that right there, there's, there's some uh, problem. But, of course, the humongous one. He's sitting here telling us the whole debate how great the Scottish system was. I mean, Adam Smith knows it. You know it. I know it. Bob Dole knows it. Everybody knows how awesome the Scottish banking system was. And I asked him, yeah, I heard it was actually, I looked up the date. It was from 1797 to 1821. Those are years. Right? I'm not talking about like at this time of day and then next Tuesday. It was from the year 1797 to 1821 that the Scottish banks didn't uh, redeem in specie. And he said, oh, oh yeah, that, that's true. And then he's lecturing and saying, how come they haven't offered these things? Well, of course, if they're allowed to go more than two decades without redeeming it, you'd be a sucker if you were bank playing by the rules and not doing that. And he even was saying, yeah, it probably wasn't even illegal. And then he said, believe it or not, their customers were relieved. I don't believe it. All right. So that, I, no, I don't think that the customers were relieved that these claims that they said you're allowed to get gold and the bank said, no, you can't come back in 25 years and maybe we'll get some gold coin. I don't think people think, thank God I can't go to the bank and get my coins back. What a relief. It's bad enough that French is going to shoot me with his, uh, you know, troops. That's Napoleon reference. That's it. Because he was French. All right. Do I need to talk about little Mexicans? Is that what we need for the, is that what this is? Okay. So now, uh, let me mention, he, he said that the free banking does not uh, encourage the boom-bust cycle. Let me just read something. This is from an expert in the free banking literature. So I agree with the claim that a, a system of free banking does not lead to the boom-bust cycle the way that like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hyde developed. But... This, but the reason is it contains it. Okay, so this expert from the free banking literature is quoting Mises from Human Action who said, issuance of fiduciary media, and fiduciary media are you know, bank, uh, claims on money the banks issue that are above the 100% reserve. So that, that's what we mean by fraction reserve banking. Issuance of fiduciary media, no matter what its quantity may be, always sets in motion those changes in the price structure, the description of which is the task of the theory of the trade cycle. Okay, so that's Mises' real flowery language, and you know, but, but Mises is saying any amount of issuance when banks issue claims to money above and beyond what they have on reserve sets in motion the, the boom-bust cycles. He's described it. The next page now, I'm still reading from this writer, this expert in the free banking literature, said, indeed, Mises' support for free banking is based in part on his agreement with this other economist who believed that freedom of note issue would automatically lead to 100% reserve banking. Okay, so this, this, this expert is, is establishing that, yes, Mises was for free banking, and he thought that would contain the business cycle, but because mark, genuine market forces would keep banks from, keep, you know, from having very low reserve ratios, that the reserve ratios would be pushed towards 100% reserves. This author I'm quoting from, as you may have guessed, is George Selgin. Okay, so this is not in dispute. George and I both agree that Mises, who developed the Austrian theory of the business cycle, of course, was saying that fractional reserve banking is the, is the problem here. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not appealing to authority per se, although it doesn't help that Mises agrees with me on this, but what I'm saying is be clear if you have thought you like the Austrian theory of the business cycle and you say, yeah, there is something there about when something happens and they get artificially low interest rate, that the people who developed that theory, what they had in mind was the banks, commercial banks, expanding credit and contracting it. Interest rates go low, unsustainable boom. There's a problem. They suck the credit out. Interest rates shoot up, and that's the crash. All right, so it was developed in the context of the banking system. Now, I think George never really disputed that per se. His only real claim was to say, no, no, trust me. Historically, when we look back and look at the freest, most unregulated systems, there's no problems, okay? And so, uh, again, but notice, he w if I hadn't brought it up, I don't think you would have walked out of here knowing that the Scottish banks, the prime example, 
suspended specie payment for over 20 years. Okay, and so yes, that explains why you don't see 100% reserve banking, and it shows you that there are crises that's inherently destabilizing. Well, um, thank you to our two very formidable, uh, very uh, energetic uh, debaters. Uh, we are now closing the voting, and while you're thinking about which way to vote, I want to invite Tom Woods of the Tom Woods Show to the stage. Uh, he's the guy who uh, cost me, uh, cost the Soul Forum so much money in drink. Uh, Tom. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's almost like, who is John Galt, the bartender who was asking me all that? Who is Tom Woods? Tom, explain who you are and what you're planning for October of uh, this uh, coming year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to Gene Epstein, and great to see everybody. In order to explain what's going on in October, I have to tell you that Bob and I host a weekly podcast called Contra Krugman, and I think all of us on this stage can agree that that's a meritorious thing to do. We critique a uh, Paul Krugman column every week. And we have a lot of fun with it. The podcast was my idea because I had been friendly with Bob for many years, and I knew that he had a talent that was woefully underappreciated in the world because Krugman would say things like, I can't believe these right-wing economists think that unemployment insurance might affect the level of unemployment. That, 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 these things are unrelated. And Bob would be in the background saying, but his own 1998 textbook says the same thing on page 324. I thought, you know, I don't know if you can monetize that kind of bizarre knowledge about another economist, but I thought, I'm going to manufacture a platform on which this knowledge will be useful. Namely, the Contra Krugman podcast, which we do every week. So if you haven't checked that out, it's at ContraKrugman.com. And then Bob and I decided, you know, we've been laboring on this podcast for quite a while. We do it for free. And we began to think, now that's just not right. There's just something philosophically wrong about this. So how can we monetize going after Paul Krugman? Because wouldn't that be the most beautiful part of it? We actually earn an income by criticizing Krugman and teaching economics by countering him. So we came up with the idea of a cruise. And you think, there's no way that's going to work. A cruise dedicated to opposing Paul Krugman? Oh my gosh, it works. It works. So this is our third year doing it. Bob and I host a week-long cruise that is a ton of fun. It's like, so you guys, you all know other libertarians because here you are here at the Soho Forum. We have people on this cruise in, in their entire lives They've never met another libertarian, and they just spend the whole week with their jaws right on the floor. Like, I can't believe this is happening. We have a ton of people who are all wonderful because what tends to happen is the crazies get sifted out because you have to pay to go on the cruise. <laughs> the crazies can't afford to go on, so it's all wonderful people. You'll get a totally misleading impression of the libertarian movement. They're all classy and well-dressed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. But... It's a ton of fun. We play, we, play, we play family feud, but it's all libertarian questions, and we really do survey 100 people. A ton of fun. Dave Smith came and did stand-up comedy, telling jokes that only we got. <laughs> Scott Horton came on board, the great foreign policy expert. Did not stop talking the entire seven days, the entire time, time to, until 3 in the morning. He was talking and talking and talking, talking about, to anybody who would listen. It's a tremendous time, so if you would like to join us, we'd love to have you. Text the word, we call it the Contra Cruise. So text the word Contra to the number 33444, and we'll send you some information. We'd love to have you. I'm a big fan. Thank you, Thank you uh, Tom. Yeah. I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of the Contra Krugman show. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, the results are as follows. Bob was, say, was, was arguing in favor of the rev resolution. Uh, the resolution got a, uh, got a yes vote of 46% initially, which rose to 55%. Bob picked up 9.4% points. That's uh, the number to beat. Uh, uh, George uh, started from the basement at, uh, at a little under 15 percentage points. He went up to 20, a little over 29 percentage points. So, so George picked up nearly 15 percentage points. Uh, George 
gets the Tootsie Roll. He went, went up 15 percentage points to, John, to, Bo, to Bob's 9 percentage points. Very close, but uh, George gets the Tootsie Roll. Congratulations.